They seem like ordinary men, articulate, educated, civilized, but they will turn into depraved, twisted monsters. They will commit acts of unimaginable cruelty, for which they will feel no shame or remorse. Here is true evil. Berlin, 1945. At the heart of the ruined city, the charred remains of Dr. Joseph Goebbels and his wife. Close by, the dead bodies of their six children. The Goebbels kill their own children, poison them, because their love for Hitler and their love for Nazism is just so great that they'd rather commit infanticide than to see the world without their beloved Führer and their beloved Nazis. Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi master of propaganda and marketing. Joseph Goebbels was brilliant at his job. He starts using simple imagery, simple wording, and he knew exactly what he was doing. He knew his audience. Joseph Goebbels, the man who sold Hitler. Goebbels elevates Hitler into a godlike figure, into a divine presence, and imbues him with a spirituality that he hopes will inspire people on a level that transcends anything that ordinary politicians could offer. Joseph Goebbels, the club-footed socialist, university academic and novelist. This extraordinarily intelligent man was one of the most evil men in history. Born in 1897 near Dusseldorf, Paul Joseph Goebbels is the sickly child of a bookkeeping clerk. Life wasn't particularly easy for Joseph Goebbels. He contracted polio very young, which left him club-footed and physically frail. As a student, he excels at school and then here at Heidelberg University, and he decides to become a novelist. He is a highly intelligent person. He earns a doctorate in Romance Language Literature at Heidelberg University. Goebbels, like many academics, is left-wing. He believes in a large state and state control. He blames free market capitalism for ruining Germany. Goebbels, in the early years, is more on the socialist side of, of national socialism. He is interested in bringing down capitalism. Goebbels has read Karl Marx. Marx vilifies the Jews as usurers. Goebbels had a pathological hatred for capitalism. He associated capitalism with a Jewish conspiracy, and his attacks on the Jews were inextricably linked to this hatred of a new modern capitalistic society which he thought had corrupted the values of a traditional and pure Germany. But Goebbels sees Soviet-style socialism as the wrong kind. The communists favor industrialization. Some of their leaders are Jewish. They proclaim themselves internationalists. Trotsky and his followers argued for a worldwide revolution. Goebbels' romantic socialism looks to the pre-capitalist past. He idealizes not the industrial working class, but the rural German folk, or Volk. In the 1920s, Goebbels is looking for political direction. He finds it when he comes across a Bavarian activist, Adolf Hitler. This is a lightning bolt moment for Goebbels. He says what Hitler has to say chimes exactly with what I'm thinking, but haven't been able to express. It's transformational. When he had seen Hitler speak, he had been mesmerized by him. And in his diaries, he talks about how he almost feels a love for Hitler. He refers to Hitler as half commoner, half god. Goebbels is enthralled by Hitler. And as it happens, Hitler needs Goebbels. 
When Goebbels joins the Nazi party, it is little more than a local Bavarian sect. In Berlin, few people have heard of Hitler's National Socialists. It will be Goebbels' job to go there and put the Nazis on the map. This is really significant because up until then, the Nazis had only really been successful in their home area around Bavaria. And Berlin was still largely under the thrall of the communists and other parties. So to crack Berlin was a key aim and objective for the Nazis, and Hitler entrusted it personally to Goebbels. In Berlin, Goebbels' first challenge is to get the Nazis noticed. In the early years, the Nazis didn't have control of media outlets or newspapers. They needed to orchestrate publicity-grabbing stunts. And to use an old marketing adage, no publicity is bad publicity. Goebbels makes rabble-rousing speeches and organizes Nazi rallies, which spill over into violence. Goebbels believes that Berliners need action and sensation to keep them engaged. So when he arrives in Berlin, he incites kind of violence, he incites people to, to be angry, and there are lots of kind of riots and attacks and thuggery, and he sees this as a way of swelling the Nazi cause. Goebbels has the Nazi supporters dress in homemade uniforms. These brown shirts intimidate and carry out attacks on homosexuals, communists, but especially Jews and Jewish businesses. The brown shirts are brazen. Their attacks are widely reported in the papers. The Nazis, of course, were a primary perpetrator of street violence in Berlin. Nazi brown shirts would be deliberately sent to a neighborhood just to invite trouble. Goebbels is, above all, at this stage, a rabble-rouser. He really wants to have actual fights that are going to create publicity, create a sense of conflict, and are therefore just going to get the Nazis into the news. But Goebbels wants his own propaganda vehicle. So in August 1927, he sets up a National Socialist newspaper. It's called Der Angriff, the attack. And that's exactly its purpose. It was full of vicious attacks on communists, Jews, Freemasons, you name it, any supposed enemy of Nazism. Goebbels used Der Angriff to focus on what he thought were the most important issues of the day. And perhaps more than any other leading Nazi, Goebbels thought the most important issue of the day were the Jews. Goebbels calls for a boycott of Jewish shops and sends out his brown shirts to intimidate ordinary Germans from using them. It is they, the capitalistic commercial Jews, who are behind all Germany's problems. Goebbels demonizes the Jews in just about every way possible. The essential message which he puts in, in every outlet is the Jews are to blame. The Jews are to blame for everything. If there's a food shortage, it's the Jews. If there's violence, it's the Jews. The New York Stock Exchange is in a panic. Everyone wants to sell. With the Wall Street crash of 1929, Goebbels' vilification of the Jews reaches new levels. Firms fold, unemployment rises, recession spreads around the world. Berlin is the political capital, but it is also a manufacturing center, and it is clobbered by the unemployment crisis. And if all that is not bad enough, the federal government doesn't seem to be able to do anything about it. The crash marks the end of an easy credit boom caused by money printing. This is the fault of the American Federal Reserve and other central banks. But Goebbels, as ever, blames the Jews. In the run-up to the 1930 election, Goebbels' poisonous anti-Semitic campaign is a spectacular success. The Nazis become the second largest party in the Reichstag. But Goebbels knows that hate is not enough. To secure power for the Nazis, he decides to use the latest marketing techniques. And for these, he turns to America.
Although Joseph Goebbels hates capitalism, he's intrigued by the emerging advertising industry in America. American capitalism is producing vast numbers of consumer goods. Keeping the coffee in the icebox? Yes, Mr. Jones, it's a new kind of coffee. To market these goods, new forms of communication and sales techniques are being developed. Goebbels will copy the techniques used by the ad men on Madison Avenue, not to sell breakfast cereal and washing up powder, but to sell the Nazis. Goebbels is in the sales business. He knows he has to sell Hitler and he has to sell the Nazi party. So he turns to the world of advertising and he becomes fascinated and enthralled by American advertising companies of the period. He even hires one and brings them over. He could have been selling washing machines or fridges with the techniques that he's using, but actually he's selling the darkness of Nazism. Goebbels starts using very recognisable imagery, simple imagery, simple lettering, simple wording. And Goebbels uses his messages repeatedly. He's very clever. He, he, they work on a simple level, but if he puts them into a brain often enough, they really sink in, they work, they, they, they mean something to people. And he knew exactly what he was doing. He knew his audience. It was clever stuff. This drumbeat of repetition makes people feel the ideas have to be right and they become an innate part of the way people see the world. And that is a propaganda and political tactic that is still very widely used today. Dr Joseph Goebbels applies his newly acquired marketing techniques to transform the image of Adolf Hitler. Hitler is seen by many Germans as just a small-minded, thuggish rabble-rouser, hateful, embittered, backward-looking. But in the run-up to the 1932 elections, Goebbels tries to recast him as modern, dynamic and optimistic. He sends Hitler on a speaking tour across Germany. Hitler travels by plane, which makes him look glamorous. Goebbels arranges for Hitler to speak at rally after rally with a message of hope and renewal. Petty Bavarian thug starts to look like a thoughtful statesman with a worked out set of policies to turn Germany around. And it works. The final touch to Adolf Hitler's vigorous election campaign was to register his vote. Here you see the Nazi leader entering the polling booth, watched by a small but enthusiastic crowd. When Germany takes to the polls on November the 6th, 1932, over 11 million people vote for Hitler. <laughs> The Nazi party becomes the largest in the Reichstag. Within months, Hitler becomes Chancellor of Germany. Hitler gets a tremendous ovation when leaving for his first cabinet meeting. Joseph Goebbels writes in his diary that night, the new Reich has been born. The German revolution has begun. When Hitler's appointed Chancellor, he is not instantly a dictator. He does not instantaneously have total political control in Germany. The dictatorship has to be built. And to do that, propaganda is fundamental. From America, Goebbels has learned the immense marketing power of celebrity. Hitler is still just another German politician, but Goebbels sets out to work on his image. From now on, Hitler will be sold as the almost mystical redeeming savior of the German people their guide, their Führer. This is the beginning of Adolf Hitler, Nazi superstar. Goebbels begins to manufacture an image of Hitler as this kind of messianic, almost cult-like figure. <laughs> Goebbels elevates Hitler into a godlike figure, into a divine presence, and imbues him with a spirituality that he hopes will inspire people on a level that transcends anything that ordinary politicians could offer. Over the radio, on film, in his carefully staged public appearances, Hitler is depicted as a national superhero idolized by his screaming fans.
This is not just clever marketing, it's not just spin. Goebbels himself believes in this and believes in it passionately. He has a kind of dedicated and almost mystical devotion to the Fuhrer. I think of all high-ranking Nazi leaders, Joseph Goebbels' devotion to Hitler is the most intense. This is a godless religion, Nazism, and it has its messiah in the form of Hitler, but you can certainly see Goebbels as perhaps the highest priest in this religion. The Nazis have gained as much support as they ever will by free and democratic means. They now move to establish a dictatorship, and as they do, Goebbels' job changes. It is no longer to influence how people vote, it is to control what they think. The first act of Nazi thought control comes from Germany's universities. In May 1933, thousands of academics march in torchlit parades against the un-German spirit. In Berlin alone, 40,000 teachers and students build bonfires to burn politically incorrect books. Hundreds of professors sign petitions supporting the Nazis. More than half of Germany's university students are members of the Nazi student organization. 97% of Germany's teachers enroll in the Nazi Teachers Association. Of all groups supporting the Nazis, German intellectuals are among the most enthusiastic. The book burnings were attended by many of Germany's leading academics. It's a sad fact that academics have not always supported free speech. Far from it. Goebbels is not behind this. When he finds out that it's taking place, of course, he rushes to the scene and he announces his full support for it. He very much wants to have control over these kinds of things, but this was a spontaneous action taken by highly radicalized Nazi university students and one that he was in complete support of. As the books burn, Goebbels declares the end of Jewish influence on intellectual life. Universities are no longer places of free and open debate. Unacceptable opinions are censored. To extend this regulation of ideas throughout society, Goebbels sets up the Reich Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda. Let's not forget the Ministry for Propaganda is also called the Ministry for Propaganda and Enlightenment. And only in dictatorships do you have ministries for enlightenment, in which you are trying to show the population uh, what they should be thinking and to enlighten them. To control what Germans think, Goebbels knows he must control what they hear and read and say. Differences of opinion, the kind of thing you might expect in a liberal democracy, were anathema to the Nazi state. Goebbels directed people's thoughts. Goebbels' job is conformity. There can be no diversity of opinion. Either you think and believe as a Nazi, or you're an enemy of the state. As under communist socialism, state regulation of the media will become a cornerstone of Nazi rule and a necessary first step towards the horrors of Auschwitz. To establish a dictatorship, the Nazis must kill free speech. So Goebbels attacks privately owned newspapers. He says they reflect the views of fat cat capitalists. They spread fake news. To protect the German public from their lies, newspapers will now be regulated by the state. News is brought entirely under the control of Goebbels. So every idea, every opinion, every reflection has to go through Goebbels. Of course, the other side of that is eliminating oppositional press, a free press. And Goebbels is at the center of it. Journalists will no longer answer to the capitalistic private owners of newspapers. Newspapers will no longer compete for readers in the marketplace of ideas and opinions. News will be provided by the state. The state will be the guardian of public opinion. Almost single-handedly, he turns journalists into civil servants. He turns newspapers effectively into pro-government pamphlets. And any newspaper that's seen to say anything even slightly critical or not supportive of the Nazi regime is simply shut down. 
With newspapers under Nazi control, Goebbels turns his attention to the new media of the time. For Joseph Goebbels, the ultimate tool of propaganda was the radio. For a newspaper, you actually have to make the effort to read it, or a book, you have to make the effort to read it. But by its very nature, radio can just be on in the background. You can just be picking it up almost subliminally. It's a very sort of invasive form of information. It was the ultimate means of propaganda, and he used it to the hilt. In capitalist America, private citizens are free to set up radio stations. But in Nazi Germany, Goebbels bans private radio stations. Only the state is allowed to broadcast radio programs. But in this, he is simply following Britain's lead. The Nazis imposed state control and monopoly of radio. Of course, the British were doing exactly the same thing with the BBC. To help get the message out, Goebbels makes available a state-subsidised affordable radio, the Volksempfanger, the People's Receiver. He has loudspeakers installed in public squares, offices, schools and even restaurants. Nazi propaganda is inescapable. But the most exciting new media of the interwar years is film. German cinemas are full of Hollywood movies. But Hollywood is Jewish and interracial. Its movies promote poisonous capitalistic ideals like freedom and individualism. Germany has budding, talented directors like Fritz Lang and Billy Wilder. But many of them are either anti-Nazi or, worse still, Jewish. To counter the influence of Hollywood, Goebbels bans American movies of which Nazi censors disapprove, and he sets up a Nazi state film industry. The German film industry, when it comes under Goebbels' control, starts going from what should be an artistic powerhouse of fantastic films made by independent, dazzling filmmakers into simply yet another organ of the Nazi state. If you live under the Nazi government and you're a filmmaker, you don't want to take many risks. Obviously, the consequences could be quite severe. So although not all films were overtly uh, propagandistic, uh, the ones that were made purely for entertainment's sake tended to be sort of banal and trite and uh, actually universally terrible. You see classically, of course, Jewish figures presented in this very hackneyed, Shylockian way. British and American films are full of humour, irony and satire. The Germans, none. And pious, bad, and custom the Juden the Nazis were deadly serious and dull. Life under Nazi rule is miserable for German cinema audiences, but head of the Nazi state film industry, Joseph Goebbels, is having a great time. He runs a really quite effective casting couch. If you want a good part in a film that's under the auspices of Joseph Goebbels, and let's face it, all the films are under the auspices of Joseph Goebbels, then it's quite a good idea to start an affair with him. One ambitious actress keen to advance her career is the alluring Lida Barova. Goebbels begins a two-year affair with Barova. For sleeping with Goebbels, Barova is richly rewarded. In the 1930s, she'll star in 34 films. Goebbels' control of the newsreels, meanwhile, allows him to turn himself and his family into household celebrities. <laughs> Goebbels has married divorcee Magda Quant. They now have six children, Helga, Hilda, Helmut, Hulda, Hedda and Heidi. Goebbels features them in his cinema newsreels, a kind of Nazi Brady Bunch. Some of the leading Nazi military commanders will drop in, almost like visitors on a celebrity chat show. And they're portrayed in the newsreels at his instruction as the perfect Nazi family. Magda is his pure and saintly mother, and the children themselves are meant to represent the Aryan future of Germany. Behind the scenes, things are more complicated. Goebbels' wife is in love with Hitler, and Hitler is rather keen on Goebbels' wife. You can see there's an attraction there. Maybe something to do with the fact that Magda was, was, was quite upper class 
and, and that was something that appealed to Hitler. In Berlin, the rumor is that Magda is sleeping with the Führer. This hardly fits with Hitler's godlike public image. He doesn't want to be involved in that. He wants to stay clear of that. He wants to stay as pure as Germany is pure. But the reputation of Hitler is quite safe. The Nazi state controls every means of communication across the whole of Germany. Goebbels was one of the first key political figures to realize how important propaganda is with all these emerging new technologies. He recognizes that you have to have control across the board of film, emerging television, radio, books. And actually, that's probably Goebbels' smartest move, is realizing that you need to lump them together. Goebbels' ministry gave him an astonishing level of control. It gave it to this one individual, this one man, who could decide what everybody read, what everybody listened to, what everybody did, how everybody grew up, how everybody thought, all of it. Goebbels is, if you like, a kind of spider at the middle of this enormous web of propaganda, uh, and that's instrumental in brainwashing the German populace. With the full power of the state at his disposal, Goebbels has all but extinguished free speech. Germans are subjected to a constant barrage of state propaganda. It becomes unacceptable to hold dissenting views. They are able to eliminate all political opposition when they make all forms of political opposition extremely dangerous. They create a situation in which it is extremely dangerous for Germans to stand up for their fellow Germans for their neighbors, for their friends, acquaintances, for their co-workers. State media control now allows the Nazis to do pretty much what they like. They are in a position to remove all restraints on themselves to begin putting into actual practice this idea of removing Jews and Jewish influence from Germany. In this rarely seen footage, Nazis drag Jewish people from their homes. Women and old people are stripped naked and are beaten. Their homes are taken, their possessions are taken. They are dragged and driven, humiliated and terrified, into the ghettos. There are many Germans appalled by what they witness, but Joseph Goebbels' state control of the media denies them any platform. The voices of opposition have been isolated and silenced. But Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi's master of propaganda, faces a new challenge when, in 1939, Hitler decides to invade Poland. The cost of rebuilding and expanding Germany's military machine is staggering, running to tens of billions of Reichmarks. This has landed Germany with a vast national debt. Hitler's supersized army cannot be supported indefinitely. It needs to pay its way. And that means war. Very few Germans actively wanted to go to war. There was still a kind of war weariness that afflicted society. Two million people had died in the First World War. So it wasn't high up on anyone's agenda, but it was Goebbels' job as Minister of Propaganda to change their minds. To justify a war, you need an enemy and a threat. Goebbels helps to sell the idea that Poland needs to be invaded through, first of all, blaming the Jews and also indicating that really Poland is this a pretty strong power that is going to ally itself with Britain, and if Nazi Germany doesn't strike first, the strike may come the other way around. So, therefore, it's this idea of a, a preemptive counterattack that's very successfully sold by Goebbels. Invading Poland is not only justified, says Goebbels, there is a compelling need to do so. Poland, September 1939. The German foe begins its ruthless march of conquest. 
As head of propaganda, Goebbels turns the war to his advantage. He won support for the Nazis with a message of hate. He established Hitler as Führer with a message of hope. Now he will secure total obedience by instilling fear. All sorts of rules came in for ordinary Germans. You weren't allowed, for example, to listen to a foreign radio station. That was punishable by death. If you did anything that was considered anti-German, then you were off to a concentration camp or you were going to be killed. It was a very narrow path. You had to be completely pro-German. You had to be totally loyal. You had to be patriotic. And if you veered even slightly off the path, then you were in big danger. Goebbels cannot hide from the German people the existence of the ghettos or the thousands of concentration camps under construction. Ordinary Germans know that their Jewish neighbors are being beaten and taken away. They hear the shocking stories told by German soldiers on leave. Inevitably, reports of atrocities committed by the advancing Germans going into Poland start to emerge. Now, Goebbels just goes into not just full denial mode, but also starts to say, if anything, it's the Jews are to blame. Goebbels reassures German people that harsh actions in war are regrettable but necessary. He orders every film studio in Germany to produce more anti-Semitic propaganda films. Films like The Eternal Jew. Wir erkennen, dass hier ein Pestherd liegt, der die Gesundheit der arischen Völker bedroht. The film is shot in the Polish ghettos. Very few of the people featured in the film will survive the war. Richard Wagner hat einmal gesagt, der Jude ist der plastische Dämon des Verfalls der Menschheit. Und diese Bilder bestätigen die Richtigkeit seines Ausspruchs. For the first year of the war, Goebbels' propaganda machine is running smoothly. As the Wehrmacht march at speed into Czechoslovakia, Poland, Norway, France, Belgium, Luxembourg and the Netherlands, the Allies can do little to stop them. For the Nazis, it's a good news story. But Goebbels is careful to manage expectations. Underneath it all, though, Goebbels realizes that excess is not a good thing. He sees himself as the nation's physician. His role in his mind is to keep the national mood at a steady, even temperature. But now, one of Goebbels' underlings makes a mistake. Nazi press officer Otto Dietrich announces triumphantly that the war in the East is all but over. The Russians will surrender within weeks. Now, Goebbels knew that this wasn't the case. He knew that the fighting was still going to be long and it was still going to be bloody. A lie on that scale that was almost immediately going to be uncovered would really shatter confidence in, in, in his whole system. So he was absolutely furious with Dietrich about this. By 1942, the course of the war is changing. Goebbels, the head of propaganda, is one of the few Germans who knows what's really going on. For the Nazis, good news is turning into bad. At last, the colossal force set out. Allied war production is quickly overtaking Germany's. Hermann Goering's Luftwaffe is losing control of the skies. Hitler's aircraft are outclassed and outnumbered. Meanwhile, the glorious offensive in the east comes to a juddering halt. German soldiers are being slaughtered. In Nazi newsreels, Goebbels tries to put a positive spin on events. But some news can't be buried. The Russians, who have suffered so much at the hands of the German army, 
are paying them back in kind. In the Battle of Stalingrad alone, half a million Germans will be killed, wounded or captured. These prisoners are just a few of over 300 plus. War has put an end to the absurd Nazi parades. The smart goose-stepping soldiers are now dying of frostbite. All the big talk about an Aryan master race is wearing thin. The euphoria has gone. Defeat on the Eastern Front is a turning point for the Nazi Reich. Goebbels looks to Hitler to stir the national spirits, to encourage the troops, to work his Svengali magic. But Hitler is nowhere to be seen. The Nazi superstar has gone into hiding. New and appropriate film has reached us. It shows further episodes in the Red Army's greatest victory so far, the victory at Stalingrad. As the war progresses, Hitler takes less of a prominent public role. So in 1943, he only delivers two speeches. This is very, very difficult for Goebbels' propaganda machine, because how do they explain this? He is absolutely the focus of Nazism. He is the embodiment of Nazism. And if he's not appearing anymore, it's very difficult for Goebbels to explain the reason why. It seems to suggest that something is going wrong. If this had been any other leader, they would have got rid of him. But this is Hitler. Goebbels has presented him as the answer to all of Germany's problems. He's turned him into a god. The Fuhrer loved the grand Nazi parades and the cheering crowds. But the growing certainty that Germany will lose the war leaves him disorientated, paranoid and morose. It is down to Joseph Goebbels to try to rally the German people. On the 18th of February, 1943, Joseph Goebbels makes a speech at the Sport Palace in Berlin, which is broadcast to the whole of Germany. The speech Goebbels gives at the Sport Palace electrifies the audience. It's about total war. It's about blood, sacrifice, determination. And he gives the German people a simple choice. There is either total war and total victory or total defeat. Goebbels' oratory is mesmeric, but the euphoria is short-lived. Most Germans, it seems, aren't as keen as he is on total sacrifice. As discontent grows, Goebbels orders further clampdowns. As Germany's military fortunes deteriorate, it becomes increasingly dangerous for Germans to talk about the war, and more and more Germans are being punished for expressing defeatism. Throughout 1943, around 100 Germans a week are being shot for defeatism or sabotage. They're being shot for telling the truth. Germany is going to lose the war. While the big guns fought it out with hidden Nazi shore batteries, our first wave moved in. With the Allied D-Day invasion, Goebbels' task looks increasingly hopeless. The skies over Germany are crowded with thousands upon thousands of American and British planes. Millions of tons of bombs are blowing Germany's factories, railways and homes into oblivion. Hitler is hiding from the carnage. 
leaving Goebbels to inspect the smoking ruins of Germany's cities. But what can he say, this master of propaganda? Blaming the Jews won't work. And newsreel pictures of grinning Aryan children do little to cheer a population that is fearful and grieving and starving. In an attempt to boost morale, Goebbels announces a space-age wonder weapon, the V-1 rocket. It can carry a one-ton explosive into the heart of enemy territory at 400 miles an hour. This, Goebbels claims, will turn the war in Germany's favor. The V-1 flying bomb was sold as this fantastic new weapon that was really going to change the face of the war, and then it didn't. This presented a problem for Goebbels. If he was overselling this, what else was he overselling? What else was he not telling the truth about it? It got the German public thinking, are we being told the truth? There is nothing Goebbels and his propaganda team can do to alter reality. Millions of Germans are dying as a result of a war Hitler started. Millions more are impoverished, homeless, and in despair. No amount of media censorship can hide it. In October 1944, the Red Army seizes the German village of Nemersdorf. The Russians, who have suffered huge losses at the hands of the Nazis, vent their fury on the population, slaughtering men, women and children. Goebbels imagines this shocking news will stir people into action. By 1944, the wheels are starting to come off Goebbels' propaganda chariot. And the slaughter at Nemersdorf by the Russians of Germans is a classic example, because Goebbels thinks this is something he needs to publicize, to buoy up the Germans into defense. But in fact, it terrifies them and alienates them, and demonstrates the degree to which Goebbels has really started to lose his grip over the national mood. In a last desperate effort to rally support for the Nazis and for war, Goebbels comes up with his final deadly publicity stunt, the Volkssturm, or People's Storm. The Volkssturm was a civilian army. They were recruited from individuals between the ages of 16 to 60. Goebbels newsreels show a feeble army of thousands of German old men and boys marching pointlessly, marching to their doom. They'd had no military training whatsoever. They were sent in to face you know, fully armed Russian soldiers just wearing their ordinary civilian outfit. They were mown down in their hundreds of thousands. Half a million of them died in the final stretch of the war. As German conscripts, old and young, are forced to sacrifice themselves pointlessly in the streets of Berlin, the mighty Aryan warrior Adolf Hitler and his head of propaganda are cowering underground, protected by 13 feet of concrete. Hitler in the bunker is a sad and pathetic and lonely figure. He's been deserted by almost all the other senior Nazis. He views this as the greatest betrayal. But there's one person who stays with him to the end, and that person is Goebbels. As we know, Goebbels and his wife have this love triangle almost with Hitler. And so he's determined to stay with his beloved Führer to the very end. And so is Magda, his wife. Of course, what this means is that their six children are going to have to stay with Hitler until the end. On April the 29th, as the guns rage overhead, Goebbels witnesses the marriage of Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun. The honeymoon is short. The next day, Hitler and his bride kill themselves. With Hitler dead in the bunker, the Goebbels' world has been destroyed. But the last act is truly, truly chilling. They decide that they cannot stand the thought of their children 
living in a world without Adolf Hitler. As the Goebbels' six children sleep, cyanide tablets are dropped into their mouths. The eldest girl wakes. In the struggle to make her swallow the pill, her jaw is broken. The Goebbels kill their own children, poison them, because their love for Hitler and their love for Nazism is just so great that they'd rather commit infanticide than to see the world without their beloved Führer and their beloved Nazis. Having killed their children, Joseph and Magda Goebbels leave the bunker. They walk to the garden of the Reich Chancellery. Joseph Goebbels shoots his wife, then turns the gun on himself. It was Joseph Goebbels, the romantic novelist, who created the Führer myth. It was Goebbels, the academic intellectual, who burned the books, trampled on free speech, and instilled the poison of National Socialism into Germany. It was Goebbels, the idealistic young socialist, who paved the way for the extermination of Europe's Jewish population. It is a chilling lesson, too easily forgotten, that the Nazi Holocaust, among the greatest crimes ever committed, would not have been possible but for Goebbels' state control of the media. The corpses of Magda and Joseph Goebbels are taken by the Red Army back to Russia. They are kept until 1970, when, without ceremony, they are destroyed. Like rubbish, the ashes are simply thrown away. 